All right. Uh, so hopefully that uh, kind of gives some light into why JP Morgan is kind of interested in this conference and you know we, we would love to hear more from other companies as well who are going through this transformation. We do this public submission system where we try and get as many speakers locally, internationally to share this story. Uh, next what I want to do, uh, switching a little bit of gears is kind of uh, We've, uh, we had actually a keynote speaker today, which was uh, Jim Highsmith, uh, sorry, Jim Highsmith uh, was not a keynote speaker, it was Jim McCarthy, uh, who was a keynote speaker. Uh, Jim McCarthy could not get a visa to India, so his trip was cancelled last minute. Uh, but we thought we'll take this opportunity to bring some of our other speakers on stage and do, uh, you know, like a panel where people can ask questions and each panelist will get a chance to take a stab at it. We'll, I'll keep a strict time on each question and I'll time out. Uh, for each question, not more than five minutes. Uh, every speaker will get a chance, whoever wants to. So let's welcome Arlo Belshi. Ravi, Ravi Kumar, Ravi is the team chair. We have Doc. And Chad. All of these guys have worked with a lot of distributed teams and uh, in my opinion have a lot of great insights in, in, in you know, how distributed teams work and how agile teams in general work. Uh, so I would you know, be delighted to hear their opinions of things that could not get addressed today, things that you still have in mind. Uh, so anyone wants to take a stab? We did have a theme for the panel which was more of uh, you know, offshoring and agile, you know, are they kind of oxymoron, are they really you know, can they work together? Uh, that's really the theme, but uh, we will see how it goes. And also, if uh, when someone puts up their hand and asks a question, uh, if that, you know, if you feel that the speakers could not answer that well, then we welcome you to take one of the chairs. Uh, any, anybody from you can come pick up that chair and answer the question. All right? And I would love to see those two chairs filled. Uh, we will use a fishbowl format. Uh, I'll just quickly explain what a fishbowl format is. So these guys are fixed. We put glue on their seats and they're stuck. They cannot get up. Uh, but those two chairs don't have glue on it. So when we have someone from the audience who wants to uh, give an answer to the question, you come grab a seat. Uh, someone else wants to give an answer can also come grab another seat. But the rule of a fishbowl is one of the chairs have to be empty. So if the second person comes and sits, then the first person has to leave uh, in terms of after answering, the, after answering the question. All right? Is it clear? If not, we'll figure it out. So who wants to be the lucky one who wants to get the first question? Right there. Go. Uh, can we have the mic, please? question is, if cost reduction is my primary intent of distributing or offshoring, uh, will Agile work there? That's something that I'm trying to understand. Uh, so let me repeat the question. Uh, so if cost reduction is the primary factor for distributing the project, for offshoring the project, will Agile work in that kind of a context? So uh, I think Scott Ambler has some good data uh, about this from several years back. Uh, the, he was looking at uh, uh, distributed teams versus co-located teams um, and uh, comparing that to agile and, and non-agile, so there are four possible combinations. Um, and it's worth pointing out, he was looking at uh, adaptive iterative, not just agile, so nuance that doesn't make much difference here, but, but includes all the agile ones. Um, so, in that mechanism, or in that uh, organization, you found a, a, a fairly strong sort in terms of productivity, in terms of how much they would deliver for a particular unit of cost, uh, which I think goes towards, towards what you're talking about. Um, you found that co-located agile teams had the highest productivity by, by a fair amount, and then below that, at some 
ratio, I'll, I'll just say 80%, but I don't, remember, I don't know what the number is, is co-located traditional teams. And then there was a huge gap, and then there were distributed uh, agile teams, and then distributed traditional teams. Uh, and so if you are distributing anyway, agility is still a benefit. However, co-locating has more of an effect than switching from traditional to agile in terms of your productivity. Um, can I? Yeah, go ahead. So, um, I distribute for my cost reduction because my cost is less there. And then I go back to the, dist you know, the offshore team and tell them that, you know, I've, all, I've started just, you know, uh, giving you work, now get me better productivity because I still want to reduce the cost. And I don't want to invest on, you know, I don't want to increase my cost out there because I, get, I want to get more value from that, the center. You know, how do we tackle that kind of a situation? They want more value, but they're resistant to cost. How do I tackle that? So we'll pause on that question. We'll let uh, the speakers respond to your first question, which is, you know, uh, you know if, if, if cost is the factor, would you go distributed and distributed agile specifically? So, what I think is uh, what it, what I think is typical is there is a cro cost productivity trade off, right? So, what do you mean by cost, right? Is it hard dollars? Because the productivity uh, hit that you take actually is a cost as well, and sometimes it is worse for you in, in terms of if you would do a team that's co-located and together versus what the productivity hit was. Now we do a lot of distributed agile projects and we found ways to make it work and we actually help our customers do it. But some of the things we find is, can you take the distribution and still make it kind of co-located? Like, so you're talking about how you could empower those teams. Well, is there more work that they can do together as a unit versus, you know, 50% of people being over here, 50% over here, and they have to figure out how to collaborate. So I think it, it, the parameters um, really matter in terms of you know, what the cost outlay is, how your teams are working to get that, uh, the proper benefit set up. That makes sense? Yeah, I think um, um, cost, yes, you can reduce it, but so long as you have certainty in what you are expecting. So if you have got requirement, there is certainty, and you want to drive low on cost, yes, you can out outsource it or uh, distribute it and get that. But if something is on an emergent nature, you are trying it out and then expect cost also to decrease while you are distributing, then I don't think it would work out. Uh, they don't go linearly in that way. So you'll have to know what is it that you are distributing and why is it that you are distributing and what's the outcome that you are expecting. So that would be the fundamental basis. Why would you want to drive that? All right. Yeah. Hey, hi. Uh, my question is, uh, in your own experience, um, what kind of fixed price contract models have you seen succeeding in an agile outsourced project? What kind of fixed price? What kind of fixed price uh, agile outsourcing contracts you have seen work? Okay. Essentially, the key factors on which this fixed price contracts were built, which you saw being successful, especially in the outsourced uh, model? Yeah, so, um, you know, the projects that I've done where it was, you know, fixed cost and, and, and we were providing, you know, the actual staffing to do the work, um, really the way that, you know, we made it to be successful was um, focusing on value, focusing on, um, you know, being able to, to uh, flex the scope of delivery, so we can we can guarantee that we're going to have something of high value by that timeline and within you know within cost. But that does mean that you know we've got to be a lot more open about the scope, and we've got to be disciplined about making sure that what we're building is you know high value stuff, and you know that we're not over architecting, et cetera, and, and getting something out there fast and you know, and iterative. Um, so it, you know if, if the if the cost is fixed and the timeline is fixed, then scope's got to flex in some way. Uh, to me, um, fixed price is an evil. It's a crime. You cannot be doing that. I mean, in the, in the sense that how it is being uh, distributed or offshore today, because everything is from a cost perspective, you want to drive it. And oftentimes, not oftentimes, most of the time in my experience, I've seen it's always been the iron triangle. 
it's always going to be fixed cost, fixed uh, scope, and your fixed quality, etc. No, there are, there has to be a trade-off. Um, and the moment you see fixed price and trying to drive down that aspect, somewhere there is a waterfall trap. Because vendors are also going to hit back and say, okay, give me something of certain, then only I'm going to commit to this. So then you are killing agility. Uh, you can still be running your project under the banner of Agile, but I don't think truly you will be Agile. And just a quick additional point. I think rarely is scope actually fixed in any way. So when you get into a space where the scope is fixed, say there's a master story list that you've agreed upon delivering, rarely is that really the list. And that'd be a good thing from an Agile perspective, right? Let's de deliver the highest value first. But it's like, oh, but what's in the contract is this master story list. So then you end up trying to deliver the value and the list which uh, that's a trap as well. So I think if you're going to do a fixed uh, uh, price thing, you have to be very careful about the prioritization parameters and the scope parameters in particular, because it, it usually up front, you don't know what you're gonna build, that's the point. It's, it's all about the feedback loops and, and being able to use those to maximize value. That's the reason we do this whole agility thing. Um, Feedback's only useful if you integrate it into what you're going to do. Um, otherwise, it's just uh, hopes and dreams and wishes. Um, so to include that, you want to give yourself options in the contract. Uh, Toyota's variable scope contracting is a great mechanism for that. Um, it does a good job of aligning so that both teams win if scope is decreased. Um, so you know, there are techniques like that that you can write into the contract so that you can inc incorporate future feedback and learning. Um, and I recommend pitching it that way, as we want to include learnings that we gain over the project in order to drive the costs down and get more value. Yeah, there's a lot of organizations um, have multiple divisions, right? And, and you know, you've got R&D and you've got production. And I think that one of the challenges that we face, one of the, things that, one of the changes that we could look at making that would really help is if we look at software development as R&D as opposed to as production. And if funding were done in that way, I think it would change a lot of this, a lot of these questions, right? It would change the context of the entire conversation. Um, and I think that's a much more appropriate paradigm for software development. Thanks. Cool, we'll go there. No one from the audience wants to add anything in? Because there's two seats still left open. So uh, there was a time when XP was I think you need to just hold on to your question. That gentleman has been waiting for a while. We'll come next to you. Sorry. Evening all. Uh, my question is related to release planning. Uh, often I'm, I mean, I come across project where I'm, I'm given a PRD document and uh, people say, I mean, uh, they just say that, you know, I'm okay with whatever mechanism or uh, approach you want to take to execute this, but I need a date by which I can come, you know, communicate back to the client or the customer as to, you know, let's say 30th of May, you're going to get this. Uh, how do we go about this? Because if you, if you want to arrive at a date, then we are going to calculate velocity and then, you know, in, in a way effort and then days and months and that, that kind of thing. So is there, is there a silver bullet to, you know, actually do that? Yes. So I think, um, from my personal experience, how much is the certainty that you have on hand to actually go back to the customer and say that I can give you by this date if you ask for a date. If you don't have certainty, then you obviously cannot uh, commit for it. Uh, at, a, at a high level, yes, you can. And that also is a high level expectation from them. That, that, is, that is okay. Uh, they would want to go, are you progressing it in that direction? And if it's on an emergent evolution kind of a thing, yes, it's perfectly valid to be there and you can benchmark against that and progress. But the point is, uh, if you are giving me a high degree of certainty and then expect driving it, then again you are getting into the trap. Uh, so it's not, it's again killing back, uh, going back on your agility. Thing. In my mind, there is a silver bullet, um, and that silver bullet is data, 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 and more data. Um, so uh, there are teams that make estimates by asking people for numbers of how many days it's going to take. That's a fairly data-free way to make estimates. Um, and you don't have a high degree of predictability um, in your results. The teams that do it by just counting the number of stories or maybe estimating the, their complexity in a, in a unit and then measuring a velocity, tracking that over time, 
checking for your variance in velocity as well as the means, using that to predict, measuring the, uh, the incoming rate and outgoing rate of stories, uh, outgoing being stories you choose not to implement. Um, when you start incorporating that sort of data into uh, your analysis of, of what's going on in the project, then you can start making very good predictions. And in fact, you can start making predictive models that I can then, uh, rather than me make a prediction for you, I will hand you the model and say, go ahead and adjust all the backlogs however you want freely in this model and it will continue to make predictions of what you're likely to get given those decisions and then pick your right decisions. Right. So, data. So uh, two points. One is uh, I think you can make escalating commitments, right? You can say, at this point, I can give you this broad brush stroke with this level of certainty. So you can create range of date and certainty. Uh, and as you progress with data, um, you, you can tighten up the, the bounds of that. Second thing that I find really useful is understanding cycle time. So if you understand from soup to nuts, okay, this is a story, these are how long it takes me to do this from soup to nuts. This is how much work and process I typically carry and that, that I can carry that's good for my team. You can kind of look at it and make a very good guess from there because you know, okay, my cycle time is 15 days and I haven't started it, so there's no way I'm going to do it in 13, right? So I, I think uh, that that's a very useful mechanism to, to start to, to make those choices. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely, I agree. Uh, the, so, you know, when I, when I am working with teams, uh, a lot of times we go in and, and, and someone will say, we've, we've got to get this team to be faster, right? Um, and a lot of times the first step is to actually slow them down. Um, step back, take a look at cycle time, take a look at lead time, take a look at you know, all of the data that you can actually gather from that team and, and figure out what the root causes are to actually stabilize the throughput. Once you've got that predictability, then you can actually start making you know, some level of, of commitment with certainty. Um, you know, we'll do um, burns with standard deviation rather than just a standard burn, so it shows what the range is of you know, our, our confidence interval against that. But you know, if, if the team doesn't, isn't, isn't stabilized first, one, you can't actually get them to go faster um, because it's, uh, there's, there's too much gunk in the works and you can't make those kinds of, of commitments, not, not with any kind of certainty. So I'll, I'll take a stab at that question as well. I'll jump in from a, uh, so I think uh, the, the, this is the first, I think uh, Jeff Patton was kind of explaining this model and I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, so he talked about the, you know, trying to look at the iron triangle and he said, if you look at the iron triangle, you have basically your scope, your cost, and your time. And typically, people would use, uh, you know, the, this is fixed, the, the scope is fixed, right? And then you would use uh, estimation to figure out what would be the cost and how long it will take, right? And this, he talks about in the traditional models, this, you know, is kind of what we focused on. But if you look at uh, you know, what some of the agile methods are trying to do, is they're actually trying to invert this triangle and they're trying to say, well, let's fix the uh, cost and the time. Uh, in, in other words, you, you give me a deadline by when something needs to be delivered, right? Uh, and we'll fix the cost because we, uh, we have a team of six people working on this or, or a fixed size of team working on it, so we know the cost is fixed for that duration. So the cost and time is basically fixed, and then you basically estimate the scope. What that means is you, you, you work in a short cycle, you work at regular heartbeat, and then you see, measure how much you're able to achieve in that short duration, and then do constant projection going forward to estimate what scope you will be able to cover in the given time. Or in other words, you're kind of trying to uh, also budget things, saying, you know, this is how much I'm willing to invest on this kind of a thing. And then, you know, we will play around with the levels of sophistication, uh, how sophisticated something will be or how uh, less sophisticated it will be, depending on your budget. So that's, uh, in my opinion, that's kind of a, a, a very different perspective of looking at, you know, this, this whole iron triangle problem. All right, we'll go down there. Yes, so there was a time when XP was uh, quite popular. 
uh, extreme programming is one of the agile flavors. Um, at least I haven't heard about that being practiced anywhere. Hello. Sorry. So there was a time when um, XP was quite popular as one of the agile flavors. I mean, probably a couple of years back. Uh, now, off late, I haven't heard any of the organizations, at least to the best of my knowledge, practicing XP. So, in your experience, have you seen XP being practiced still, or is it that Scrum or others are kind of de facto for practicing Agile? So, uh, as a strongly XP biased person, <laughs> I'm going to answer accordingly. Um, so. Scrum has a number of very strong advantages over XP. Um, it is marketable. Um, it is easily transmittable. Um, someone who has done Scrum for a short period of time is able to transmit that knowledge to somebody else. Um, and therefore, it has a much shorter doubling time in the marketplace. Uh, so it's not that XP has decreased. The amount of XP in use has actually increased, but is increased with a very slow doubling period. It takes a very long time to, to spread. Scrum has been driving all of the agile adoptions for a while because it's marketed well, well um, and it's easy to transmit. And so as we start getting more and more agile visibility, it's really a lot more Scrum visibility. Um, <clears throat> but we are still finding that uh, the teams that are really delivering well, if you want to get to two-star fluency, XP is still the game that, that gets you there. Uh, Scrum is a great way to get to one-star fluency. We see a lot of teams get there and then fall into certain technical debt traps and then go look for XP. So one of the things that I've, uh, that I've seen happening is, um, in a way, Scrum is consuming XP. Um, yeah, so I was involved in uh, creating some of the uh, Scrum Certified Developer curriculum um, and teaching it uh, a couple of years back. Uh, and it was a Scrum course, and it was a Scrum certification. But throughout that course, we were talking about pair programming, uh, you know, uh, test-driven development, continuous integration. You know, we were talking about all of these, you know, many of these practices that actually came from, you know, XP um, and just kind of folding them into, uh, you know, uh, into uh, Scrum training, so it's a little convoluted these days, a lot more than it was, I would say, you know, four or five years ago. I think there's a bifurcation of people thinking about Scrum in terms of project management and analysis, uh, and there's probably an overlap to the extent that XP did talk about stories and using stories and pushing those through but that now when you hear people say, I'm doing engineering practices, as uh, the, the folks, um, forget what company that was up here uh, yesterday, said, you know, we're moving from doing all scrum to now we're doing engineering practices. Essentially, they're adding XP. So people, people might not be saying that they're adding XP, and the, the word also became dirty for a little while, because people said, extreme programming? Why did you name it that? So n now people say, I'm doing agile engineering practices. They're doing XP. So XP is, is, is alive and well and flourishing. I've actually not been to a single organization or a team which is doing code and code scrum and is not doing mini waterfalls. <laughs> I've not seen a single company in 12, 13 years of my you know, experience with agile who's doing code and code scrum and is not actually practicing mini waterfalls. It's, it's essentially mini waterfalls every month. Or two weeks. Yeah. Or two weeks, yeah. if they can sustain it. <laughs> One month itself is hard. Yeah. Two weeks is burning people out. Yeah. 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 All right. We'll go. Yeah, there's a gentleman who's already got the mic and we'll go there next. Good evening, everybody. My question is, this is uh, going to sound a little bit skeptical. Um, last two days would be uh, my first exposure to Agile and hearing lots about Agile. And I've been hearing nothing but um, almost like a nirvana state, right? Everything is going to be great. Customer gets early. We are going to have less surprise and low cost, self-organizing, and the list is goes on. My question is, if this is so true, and, this, and, and I believe so, based on what I heard, what stops some of our executives? You know, I assume all the CTOs and CIOs are the best in notch. Why is that um, there is a big of jump into this bandwagon 
and we see almost agile development across the board versus what we are seeing today, just more waterfall and then less of agile. So I would like to hear a little bit more on what do you think is some of the blockers from the executive standpoint? So what are some, what are some of the blockers? What are some of the blockers for adoption of Agile? I, so I think that uh, this is a highly culturally nuanced question. Um, so the blockers you're gonna see in the US are totally different than the blockers you're gonna see in India. Um, and the rate of adoption that you're seeing in, in the cultures are going to be entirely different. Um, like in the US at this point, people are talking about, yeah, it's pretty much everyone's doing agile. Um, only the laggards are left and they're already flipping. Um, the waterfall traditional stuff is mostly dead. Um, and the challenge is that a lot of at this point, the transitions are in name only. They're doing the same things they were doing under waterfall, which weren't waterfall anyway. Um, and now they're calling it Agile, just as they were previously calling it Waterfall, it's really cowboy. Um, so it's it's not that people are uh, uh, you know are avoiding the Agile transitions. It's that they're we're down to the point that it's the people who are white labeling whatever it is that they're doing anyway. Um, that's not that's totally different when you go to different cultures. Um, one of the big things that I think is is uh, driving part of that is Agile done well fundamentally decentralizes power. Uh, it fundamentally shifts from central decision making to much more distributed decision making. Um, and if status is associated with who makes what decisions, then that is a shift of status, power, and influence all at the same time. And that has huge cultural ramifications um, in companies and uh, creates quite a lot of resistance. And back in the, the days when Agile wasn't the dominant, we very often saw Agile show up in one or two portions of the company and then the antibodies would come back and come out and destroy it. And it was because it was decentralizing that power. So to me, I mean, piggybacking on what Arlo said, um, my experience has been, I've, I've worked some time in the US. Uh, while I'm from India, I work some time in the US. And that cultural thing, what manifests in the organization makes a huge difference. We never had agile as an agile as a banner, but then there was always customer collaboration working with the business. Uh, I had not read about Agile at that point in time, but I remember uh, the manager making a statement, if something goes down in production, then I'll get to know, I'll come and talk to you. Uh, otherwise, business will not complain to me, you're doing a good job, right? So that was a perspective. Coming back to India, uh, there was a whole lot of process and all those things, and the experience was that we never did a perfect waterfall in India. While we talked so much about waterfall and things like that, we never did perfect waterfall because it was always chaotic. Uh, requirements was never frozen. In fact, we got to know the requirements only in UAT. The point is when you go to a waterfall and it's kind of, I have, I think, stopped making a comparison between waterfall and agile that way. But then the good aspect of agile, what has to be taken in or inculcated is the, the value for the system and what Arlo was mentioning, the decentralization aspect. Uh, you cannot be chaotic and then say that is agile which is again a misnomer. It requires high discipline to be agile, uh, and it also requires some of the authority and the, the powers to be delegated back to the teams, and they can govern themselves. So that takes a fundamental shift, and we are not in that kind of a culture, if I have to talk. We are more control-oriented as opposed to giving off that. So. so I'm gonna say something that might be slightly offensive, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> You have to just be yourself, Chad. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there's actually what I call a generational lag in technology management. And that is this generation of managers was last generation of technologies developers. Right? That makes sense, right? And so oftentimes you have people who are managing now who are disconnected from what's the current state of practice, both in technology and in process. And the, when you have to explain to someone who, you know, cracked their, their life on COBOL mainframes and their worldview is developing on that, and then you're saying pairing, unit testing, all these things that are kind of foreign, it's hard to make the intuitive leap that all these things are wonderful and I should do them, right? I had a conversation with uh, a business leader about continuous integration once, many years ago. And we went through this whole thing about continuous integration and why it was wonderful. And she said at the end, okay, yeah, yeah. 
uh, I'm just trying to make my merge go from eight weeks to four weeks. So how can you help me with that? And I said, but there would be no merge. And she's like, I don't believe that. That's crazy talk. I'm like, no, no, no. People do this all over the world. <laughs> and she was like, you got to be kidding me. This make, I want four-week merge. Forget that CI. I, I don't believe it. Uh, and I think that's, um, it's hard for people to grok. Yeah, so uh, I'll, uh, we, because we have just started our Agile transformation a year back, and we are a 260,000 people organization, and uh, thousands of people in technology. So the first thing I think uh, that the organization has to believe that there is pain. Uh, we, we are in a, banks are in a highly regulated environment. Regulations are changing almost every day. And uh, we realized that our technology is not agile. There was another problem. To, to make it, uh, uh, make the organization agile, what we realized is that most of the people, uh, they stop learning the moment they join the bank. Basically, we, we learn through our college, but once we join a company, that's when we stop learning. That is, we don't pick up those books. Uh, well, there are, of course, passionate technologists like uh, the folks sitting here, uh, but mostly in most companies, people don't learn. So what we have decided is that we first want to enable a learning organization. And, and Agile is very, very difficult to get it right, especially in a large organization. For a small company like WhatsApp, it's very easy. Uh, I have worked for a startup for 10 years in the US, so I know. Uh, but, but here, uh, the, to implement Agile, first things is those managers have to go and sit with the teams and work with the teams in implementing those best practices. Uh, well, I would even say it as good practices because you evolve them. Uh, and uh, to, to, to just tell a team to implement continuous integration, it's not going to work. To make them believe that continuous integration is like breathing air, uh, it takes time. And it's going to take a long time for any organization that starts with. So we have started at the sea level first. So when we hired this uh, world famous coach in Lean Agile, the first thing he said is, I am not going to speak to anybody but the sea level. We are going to first spend time, a lot of time with the sea levels. We are going to coach them, and then we'll go down the organization. So uh, it has to start, the coaching has to start, uh, start at the top, not at the bottom. Yeah, so uh, the reason I came over here was because I went through the transition from you know doing SDLC to Agile, and I've also spoken on that. Uh, so typically, we've, uh, what we've noticed is, uh, especially if you are in a service provider setup, uh, in many cases, uh, the customer would say, we want to go Agile. But why they want to go Agile uh, and what Agile actually requests, uh, requires are two different things. They want to go Agile because they want things faster. Um, and and in, the, in this case, when I say customer, it could be uh, the management. But they don't realize that they need to change as well. Um, so it's, it's like, we need to go Agile. I need things in two weeks. Um, and you guys go and do it. So that's the first problem. Um, expecting that we don't need to change. You know, you guys change and then start the building. And the second thing is investment. Um, so uh, there is a process side, which sometimes is easy. You know, you can start stand-ups. What's a big deal? People just stand up. You can do retros. What's a big deal? You know, give an hour, do it. But true transformation happens when you, when you have to invest in the platform, which is, you know, continuous integration, automation tests, maybe performance tests. You actually need to pay money to get licenses in these cases. You probably need to get hardware. People don't think about it. You don't actually put in that initial investment to make those transformations. So you expect with a stand-up and a retro for the teams to just transform and start doing things. You expect that teams will do showcases um, with just a stand-up and a retro being instituted. That doesn't work. That's been the typical challenge that we always have. All right. I want to add to that, uh, basically, I have two perspectives, right? Uh, so you were saying what is stopping companies from jumping on this brand wagon. Uh, I see every company jumping on this brand wagon. Uh, tell me a company which is not jumping on the brand wagon. I can't think of any. I mean, I've spoken to so many companies. Everyone's jumped on the brand wagon. A lot of them are dropping off the brand wagon as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's 
14 years now, uh, and I think it's pretty uh, old in my opinion. Uh, if you look at a lot of Indian services company, they are jumping on this brand wagon for one specific reason. Any guesses? No? Customer required it. If I do it, I get business. If I don't do it, I don't get business. I did CMM before this. I did something else before this. I'll do now Agile, right? Send 10 people, get CSM certified. Send 10 people, get some other certified. Show that as the uh, profiles we have in the proposal that we send. And there we get a project, right? So a lot of services organizations, in my opinion, are falling into that trap, right? So I think to your question, I am not aware of a single organization, I'm sure there are, but I'm not aware of a single organization which has not jumped on this brand wagon, right? Uh, I'm talking about services organization. Now let's look at India has a huge number of captive product companies, right? So you have a, a product company in, uh, you know, in Europe or in US or in Australia, and then they have an offshore development center or an ODC over here, uh, you know, and why are those guys jumping on the brand wagon? because they want to bring more control over here. They want to have better say in how things are being done, right? So that's another direct uh, motivation for people to kind of uh, show that we have agile skills and trying to get better work instead of just doing glorified generator's job, right? So there is that other factor for people trying to do, uh, bring a lot of uh, agile into the organization. So I, in my opinion, I, I don't see what you're saying as uh, happening at all. I see the exact opposite happening. I don't know the exact percentage, but we analyze it because they are one more agile. We have the population I don't have the numbers. If top of my head, I would have to say 90% of organizations claim to be doing agile. 90% of organizations claim to be doing Agile. Uh, doing Agile itself is an oxymoron in my opinion. Uh, if you really want to go more into it, I would uh, strongly recommend watching uh, Andy Hunt's webinar that we did before the conference where he talks about, you know, the day we wrote the manifesto, it was dead for him. Uh, because he, he says that, you know, it was essentially, uh, we, we try to make this as a static thing while it was a something dynamic heading somewhere that we didn't actually know. And we've kind of made it very static now. Yeah. So if you want to see the numbers, um, there are two reports, State of Agile report and State of Scrum report, um, and they have a whole bunch of data on who's doing what and how many uh, uh, of all IT projects are, are in there, whatever. I don't have the numbers off the top of my fingers, but lots of people at this point are at least claiming to do, to do those practices. Right, and there's a lot of fudge. For example, historically, continuous integration on those reports is like 50%. When you dig in into it with people and you say, are you doing continuous integration? Yeah, but my nightly build is running just fine. And you're like, no. That, that's still better, right? I have the CI server sitting there, <laughs> right? We are doing continuous integration because the server is there, right? How often do you check in? Uh, once before the end of the sprint, <laughs> right? That, that will be lucky. That I'll be lucky. Yes, Once we'll go there. Maybe. Once hey guys, the, so it's quite clear that Agile is certainly booming. Uh, we now have frameworks to scale Agile. <laughs> so, Thanks for the sarcasm. <laughs> so uh, my question is, uh, what's the panel's thoughts on the scaled Agile framework? Ooh. I thought that might be a bit of a curveball. You, you, you want a public answer to this question? <laughs> you're, you're outing us here. Right, you're switch the cameras off. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I'll let you go. All right. So, um, so uh, okay, first I'm going to, uh, again, state my biases. Uh, so, I, I work at Microsoft. I do uh, company transitions all over the place. Um, uh, you know, I, when I do a pilot, a pilot is 150 people at a time. That's just a small thing you try on the edge, right? Um, so when I'm talking about scale, I'm thinking large scale. Um, so I'm not going to propose an alternative uh, way to, to handle scale until it works at least 600, 700 people at a time. Um, 
from the conversations that I've had with Alan Shalloway on scaled out of a framework, it's really well targeted at the 150 person size, for which I say, well, that's interesting. It's a pretty good pilot. Let's see whether it works. Now, go ahead and see whether it works. I'm not going to bring it in in my case. Um, there are some things that it says are important, but I don't feel it places enough of emphasis on those, um, and in particular, uh, the technical practices. Um, if you're doing the technical practices, if you're doing XP-like or adaptive engineering at those teams, you just drive a lot of risk and cost out. And when you drive out a lot of that risk and cost, then you have fewer problems to solve at the higher level. There's a whole lot of weight in that, in that framework that's there to prevent um, screw-up cascades, to prevent an error in one team from cascading to another and another and another. Um, if you're doing the technical practices, you just don't have as many screw-ups, and each team has more ability to recover from a dependency screwing up, so you don't need to prevent those cascades as, as much. And it makes me wonder why you have so much heavyweight process at the top for dealing with what can be a non-problem if you simply solve it. Um, to me, I, <laughs> I, I cannot give a direct answer as Arlo gave because my work is in a different kind of an organization. It's predominantly IT services. I really don't see a point of scaled frameworks in an IT service organization. We are so dynamic. Uh, there are multitude of complexities, multitude of service lines and industries that you support. I really don't see how exactly can you scale other than the verbiage that you're going to carry with you. Uh, because fundamentally contexts matter and these contexts are so much of variability in those contexts. Um, and when you look at scale and things like that, there has to be a certain amount of standardization, vocabulary and those kind of things all put together and commitment from the management and also the customer. There are too many ands, 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 and I see lots of ifs, ifs, ifs. If they work, then it happens. I don't see the first if happening. Um, so I don't see how it would actually do that. But yeah, good try. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We can turn off thing. the video. <laughs> so, uh, I think obviously there's a need to give people uh, and I said this in my process talk about an hour ago, guideposts on thinking about how to think through things. But I, I'm, I'm suspicious of any framework in general that says, hey, to be successful, you should work like me because 10 other people have done it. Um, so I, I'm biased there and I'll put that out. There are a couple other issues. One is I think the skilled Agile framework doesn't say enough of what not to do. So there's a lot of stuff in the framework, do this, do this, there's some heavyweight stuff in there, but there's very little don't do this. Uh, and my, what I've seen, observed, is that organizations with bad practices and bad ways of thinking that want to scale agile can wiggle bad behavior into lots of the little uh, nooks and crannies of the framework, right? So you'll see people do things like analysis decomposition, which the framework talks about in a very nice way about, you know, at this level do this, at this level do this, but then you see people where essentially at some high level of the uh, organization, the analysis is what's law, and then it's being pushed down and shoved to teams. And at no point do people say, this is bad, don't do this kind of thing as part of the framework itself. It's so heavy on evangelization at this point. Do the scale agile framework, is great. That people aren't saying, do the scale agile framework, but don't do these bad things. The other bit that uh, concerns me is I think there's some, um, hmm, there's some voodoo math in how certain things are set up. So the normalized estimates across teams, it just, I look at it and go, Ugh. First of all, you can't normalize estimates across teams. Getting people to estimate the same way is a fool's errand in my opinion. Uh, and even if you could, the point of it in the framework is to help you make ROI uh, 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 judgments about what to do next. That would assume that not only the estimation itself is consistent, but the execution is consistent. So if I estimate something as a 30, the other people estimate something as a 30. We both on average have to do it as a 30 
for it to make sense at the ROI level. But if you do it as a 15 consistently, and I do it as a 45 consistently, well then, did my estimates mean anything? So I think, you know, and you see this too with people doing scrum at scale and rolling up release burn downs across story points of many teams. There's just lots of stuff where you're like, man, did anybody really think about the math of that? So I think that there's some things like that in the scale of the Agile framework that I don't think make a lot of sense either. Um, overall, I think there's some good nuggets and some good things for people to learn, uh, but it's not something I would like be excited about. So, uh, so also, now I haven't seen the scaled agile framework work in practice, and that's not that uh, I've seen it fail, it's that I haven't seen it work in practice. Um, that said, I have seen a number of other things scale very easily to similar sizes. Um, so when I look at the teams uh, inside Microsoft that are scaling to thousands of people, um, they're pretty much using one of two approaches. They're either using a waterfall-like plan, um, which works pretty well, and I actually highly recommend it. Um, adaptive or Agile waterfall, great technique, um, and it works. Do simultaneous phases, but go ahead and plan like you have for large projects with very fixed delivery dates. It works for that system. Um, or the other one that they're doing is a very decentralized metrics-based approach. Um, so this is the way that Yammer works, for example, where they do continual analysis to understand what are the leading metrics that correlate with future revenue to what degrees of correlation? And then what are the experiments that we can do that have what impact on those leading metrics? At that point, they've now decentralized the decision of, who, of what should we execute on such that each individual team can start making calls that optimize for the global whole. That breaks the whole planning problem and they don't need central planning in order to get unified results. And they can scale very high. So I enjoyed very much what you said about uh, scaling Agile, that uh, the framework doesn't say uh, what not to do. And this reminded me of uh, what we used at Siemens for scaling Agile, and we still are using it in different organizations, is the book from Bas Potter and Craig Lahman, Scaling Lean and Agile Development. And this is something that was very, very helpful because I think in basically every organization is different and every agile or lean adoption is different and we need to have to uh, look at different uh, things that will work in this context and not work in another context and we have to know uh, under which circumstances we should try something and uh, not try something else because it would not work there and there, this book was of tremendous help for us, for the organization with several hundred developers also all over the world to uh, get to a good own Agile framework. That is, maybe it's in some uh, things, it's similar to the scaled Agile framework, but I think out of the box, an Agile framework will not work anywhere. So I once heard someone really authoritative in the Agile space say that, uh, you know, they looked at the scaled Agile framework, they looked at DAD, which is the disciplined Agile delivery, and they said, uh, you know, this is exactly what we were trying to avoid 14 years ago. <laughs> right? So that's someone who wrote the manifesto, uh, making a public statement saying this is exactly what we were trying to avoid. but somehow we don't seem to be learning from our mistakes. That was well summarized, thank you. We had a gentleman over there and then we'll come here. Sorry guys. <laughs> oh, you already have, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, can I add a quick comment on the last one just? Uh, we have used in our work with quality system and agile, we used action research, which is not known as an agile method, but something which was around since 1920 as a research method within organization, it's a collaborative method. I just recommend you to look into that when you want to change in the organization, to look into action research. I think it can be very helpful. It's an agile method, but it was before agile. Um, now to my question. Uh, I have worked with, I have pioneered agile in my organization, and it worked very well for outsourcing from Scandinavia to India as such. 
But one area where we have struggled has been with the product owner role. We use Scrum and XP. Uh, but the product owner role has been a challenging one. Either the customer have provi provided one person, and it's mostly non-IT companies who are our customers. They provided one person who have been a product owner, but they have not fully understood that role. They have not wanted to participate on a regular <coughs> basis. Therefore, we tried with having a proxy in India uh, who has worked together with that customer product owner and do it. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it has not worked. I'd like to have some <coughs> feedback about how to work with this critical part of to get the Agile to work together with customers, in particular end users and customers who are not mature and understand the Agile methodology itself. So um, I'm uh, another bias in that uh, I'm a product manager by trade, spent the majority of my career doing that. And I think that the Scrum product owner role, um, because it doesn't talk about the discipline of product management fully and take some pieces of it, uh, is open for sort of an asymmetry of people not committing to doing what you need, right? I'm a SME. I'm some person over the side, and I want some product built, but I'm going to give you a little sprinkling of my, within my head, as opposed to actually sitting down and going, okay, I'm building a thing, a product. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of uh, how the, the role is defined in the community, lending itself towards bad behavior. But uh, what I think the ultimate answer to what what you're saying is that we need to evangelize that we're actually out in the world creating more products. Whether they be internal, whether they be external, we're creating a lot of products in the world. We need more people doing product management and agile project ma product management. Uh, and I think when people uh, have it as a, at least a role, maybe not a full job, uh, but when that's clear and the, the norms of it are clear and what, what the responsibilities are in a larger way than the product owner, I think um, you'll, you can get better engagement because it's, it's core to the, the responsibility of building a thing that's a product becomes real to people. So I think it's hard to get a SME that uh, in, a, in a case where you get a sprinkling of their time to engage in general. I think that's a kind of a, a flawed thing that we have. So I look at this from a systems thinking perspective. Um, I find that a useful way to analyze the various options. Um, fundamentally, the thing that seems to determine the effectiveness of the, uh, of the product design or the, the product direction, we'll call it, um, is the length of the feedback loops and the number of delays um, and the amount of information that makes it through. Each hop from brain to brain loses like about 90% of the information. Um, and every hop uh, causes delays. Um, and then a hop that's international will Sorry. Yeah. I was just kidding yeah. you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so an international hop is going to cause even more delays and or more information loss, depending on how it's executed. Um, so the teams that I've seen that have the best uh, direction with the customer have, they don't even have product owner roles. They have developers that are able to directly analyze the data of direct user behavior and experiment on those users directly um, in order to gain very good, clear information. There's one level down where you have a product owner role that's doing that experimentation. There's one level down below that where you have a product ro owner role who's making guesses based on their opinions and their experience, which is now lagged information on the basis of, of direct customer. And then you can go further to you know, distribute that or have a customer role proxy. But just from a pure systems thinking perspective, it's all about how could I eliminate more hops and how could I eliminate more delays, go all the way towards zero. Uh, can I just comment on that? Uh, the problem has sometimes been that the customer is not able to explicitly communicate what they want. That one I called as a proxy has often been the one who has facilitated that doc uh, discussion. That sometimes worked very well, but it's not always worked. That's why I asked. I've actually never met a customer who can clearly communicate what they want. No, no neither have I, but I meant that <laughs> there are those who are better. And, and if, those they, if they think they, they know exactly what they want, then you, you pretty much can shut down your project on day one. <laughs> we don't because need Agile then. So. 
so, so you're I, I think, I think uh, proxy cannot be the conduit for successful you know product owner or a manager uh, proxy may not be the right word I, right uh, what because I would often times when you when you send it off like this in a proxy manner there is also he is proxy and passive also uh, he is not empowered to, to take any decisions uh, so how can he communicate to the teams so for every decision he has to make he still has to connect back to the product owner and he's not available and he himself doesn't know uh, so that's where the challenge is so I, I think that uh, part of the so I think we all agree on that this is a problem and I, th I think that um, I might have some of your same background coming from a Scandinavian context myself so how to address this problem and especially in the Scandinavian context. So uh, I work in Norway uh, with teams in Sri Lanka. And um, uh, we have some fe two features of Norwegian organizations that are um, helping us. The first feature is that um, people are usually open to informal decisions. So you can have things kind of happening without a formal decision being made. The second one is that people like people even though they can seem kind of cold, people like to have this feeling of, of a nice conversation, of like inclusiveness is an important value, I think. So what we've found to be very useful is to create a workshop in a remote setting where we get the developers in the room and we get the product owner and the SMEs and whoever is there in the room and we sometimes have to trick them a little bit in why we're pulling them in here. So we're saying, you know, we want you to, we want to introduce the team to you. We want you, we want to have sort of a round table thing. These are things that are, are very accepted in a Nordic um, culture, I think. And then we make that into a first situation where we make the, the developers and the SMEs and the product owner talk together. And from there we're saying, we like this, we, suggest you do it more and and then we're and then we've got started anyway so i hope that uh, is applicable in your setting as well cool. i have a question you need to add you could come up someone i have a question on uh, paid programming yeah go ahead yeah so i have a question on paid programming that is a basic question so can you just hang on? He needs yeah. to complete something. Please, yeah. Hello. Uh, just two lines to share is uh, we had this kind of issue and, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, and we tried to uh, uh, ask for more involvement from real customer. And so one of the reasons came is uh, I don't have time. And uh, other thing was, uh, it, like, I, I told you clearly what I need uh, from their perspective. And they said, once it is done, then I can, I can be in the feedback loop. So literally our team uh, build a fake uh, feature and just like a UI stuff and say, oh, it's done. And the guy like a proxy uh, say, thought it's done. And then we went to the customer and had the feedback, actually. So th that's something like, uh, you know, I think you, you also added like, you have to come up with something. <laughs> That's a brilliant idea. It's actually a pretty common idea. It works pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Design thinking. It's we do that with real users all the time. All the time. <laughs> uh, do you think yeah. the customer need to, uh, need to have the agile mindset for an organization to adopt Scrum? Does the customer need to have an agile mindset to adopt Scrum? Maybe an easier question is if a customer does not have an agile mindset, what's the best thing for them to do? So, well, all right, so my challenge with the question, I guess, is that for, for, for my current role, for my context, uh, the customer is an end consumer out there that's, you know, browsing around the web or has a phone in their hand, um, and I really don't care if they have an agile mindset or not. It makes, it makes absolutely no difference to us. Um, uh, and, and some do and some don't, right? 
Um, so I, contextually, the, 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 the question is a little difficult for, for me. Um, I'm imagining that, it's, that it comes from uh, in a cons consultative way. Uh, and in that, um, having, having also done that kind of work, uh, it, it is far more challenging if the customer doesn't have an agile mindset. Um, you know, oftentimes, oftentimes we were doing transformations, um, so they were asking us to to help them uh, help them get there. Um, you know, but we also just found that for a customer that didn't really have that mindset, you know, a really high communication, um, setting expectations up front. Here's how the project's going to work. Here's how we're going to do things. Here's how it's going to be funded. Yes, every you know every week or every two weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to say. All right, that's it. I'm cutting the funding off. The project's over, or we're going to keep going. Um, you know, there are some benefits that that uh, would attract them to the idea of an agile approach. Um, and as the project progressed, the relationship got better and better. So there were some that when we started, they didn't have really an agile mindset. By the time it was done, they didn't want to do it any other way. Um, so I I think you know you don't even have to use the word agile. Um, in most cases, I would assume that customers want uh, value delivered at a low cost, and customers want to have a good sense of progress. Forget Ajay. Mo almost all customers would want maximum value at the lowest cost, um, and would, wa would want to have a good sense of progress being made. Um, so if you could have a conversation around those, and expect that you know, we want your feedback so that we can deliver quickly. Uh, the transformation would happen automatically. Um, so the, the discussion around Agile itself need not really happen, so long as customers have this broad principle in mind. I, I, I'll jump in here real quick. I think there are different kinds of customers. Uh, you know, for some customers, the reason to go for Agile is basically I want to uh, or not to go, the, the reason for some people to outsource their development is basically they want to push the risk off their head to someone else, right? Uh, is, is that this is risky, we don't quite understand it, we don't want to do it, let's push it off to someone else, and now it's their risk. So let's try and get a contract in place, let's try and get a date and time and cost in place so the risk is off our head, right? In that kind of a context, how you educate the customer about Agile or whether Agile is even important for them is, is something to ponder upon, right? Because fundamentally what they're trying to do is uh, push the risk off their head. And if you understand that and if you can explain to them that or rather demonstrate to them that, you know, this technique of whatever, call it blah, that you're doing can actually reduce risk, then they would appreciate what you're doing much more. Right? So it doesn't, you don't have to go big gungo, let's do a five-day agile workshop because we're going to educate you or baptize you to, to be agilist from now. Right? You, just, you just say, well, what you're trying to do is push risk off your head. We understand that what you're trying to do is high risk. So we will try and work with you to reduce the risk. Right? So that's one approach to take. In some cases, people want to do agile because they have heard uh, a bunch of stuff from other people and they're trying to push you to do agile, but they don't have the mindset. Right? And there, it's already a failing game because there is a lot of misconceptions to be cleared. And that, that's another situation where, you know, you do need to help deal with the misconceptions first uh, before you kind of get into the whole agile mindset with them. Ironically, in terms of customer, the word, so I build products for companies, so we do enterprise software, essentially. Uh, but we, we build products for people wanting to do Agile. But um, it's surprising how many people want old school roadmaps. So they'll tell you, oh, what are you going to build for a year? I don't know, because I'm Agile about it. So I want your feedback, because maybe I'll build what you want next. Uh, but people are like, no, give us the, the roadmap for a year or two before we buy. Or you'll see people saying, I don't want those releases. We're like, hey, we release all the time. You know, four or five times a year, now we have SaaS, we release, like, you know, we just put stuff out there. We don't want that, that's destabilizing. And it's like, well, wait a second, don't you guys do Agile? Yeah, so it's like, well, do you give your customer a two-year roadmap? No. Then, so, in, in our case, it actually is a fair amount of friction. If someone wants to buy an Agile tool, but they're not quite Agile, it's uh, strange. 
So uh, something I just want to add here is a uh, lot of time context when here, that's where context matters. Uh, more than the customer, customers are serving a market and certain markets are more dynamic than say other markets or certain domains are more uh, dynamic than the other uh, you know, domains. And that dynamism in that domain sometimes, you know, drives the agility or, you know, the requirements of the customer. Uh, so, and, and certain domains are becoming much more dynamic than what they used to be in the past, right? Uh, and that's exactly where, you know, most of the voices that you hear from customer comes. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, you, we need uh, somewhere the delivery, computer, uh, I mean, the software delivery to be aligned with the dynamism of the market and that's what exactly customer is looking at, really. So a lot of the comments here have been about uh, it doesn't matter so much whether it's the agile mindset and that it's, it's much more about the outcomes and be able to get to agreement on, on what you mutually share as the values that Agile will help you deliver on. Um, totally agree one of the values that your customers, that almost all customers are bringing in um, that will not necessarily align with you is uh, sort of what Naresh was talking about. Not only do they want to move risk onto you, they want to move executive function onto you. As a customer, I want to not have to think or worry about things. It's one of the biggest values that anyone gets from buying something is I can just buy it and then not think about it. Um, so that can directly get into the conflict. Even someone who has an agile mindset, yeah, I, I want to, for the things that I want to worry about, tweak it all the time. For the rest, I want to install it once and have it work and have magic show up every couple of days and never have any magic go away. Um, and it's up to you to make that happen. Um, so that's where, uh, getting back to some of the previous comments about customers, customers won't tell you what they need um, and they don't, they, actively want to not worry about this. So look for other ways to get the data. Um, use your experience designers and uh, design thinking and all sorts of techniques have been developed for finding the data based off user behavior and the like. Those can supplement a more rare conversation with the customer. All right, I need to call this off because people have been telling me time out, time out. <laughs> so. <laughs> We have dinner that's ready for you guys and I hope that we will continue this Q&A as we go through the dinner and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be around here to go on. There's one question over there. I, I, I'll, I will take that question along with Sahid with all the speakers and we'll have dinner and we'll take that question. Yeah, this is regarding uh, pair programming. This is a basic question. I'm a verification engineer, so we are planning to adopt this uh, continuous delivery and pair programming for the next release onwards. So. Uh, right now, our ratio of the developers and the testers is 4 is to 1. So we are happy with that and uh, what the testing has to be done within the release, so by one tester. So if you're going for the paid programming and paid programming and continuous delivery, and this ratio is not, I mean, not practically doesn't work. Four developers and one tester, right? So what is the preference or what is the preferable ratio size for the paid programming and continuous delivery? Uh, I mean, they automate everything within the release. So all these considering that. So what is the preference you, uh, dollar percent ratio, uh, test stress ratio? People who want to leave can suddenly leave. We will finish this question and then we will leave. Right. Uh, we guys will leave at later, but those who want to leave can go ahead. It is all about the context. Um, the ra proper ratio of devs to testers depends a lot on what the testers have to do because of what the devs are doing. Um, so teams that have good, strong, two-star agility, the devs are no longer writing bugs. And when they're no longer writing bugs, then uh, testers have a very different role. Um, and I've seen a lot of companies that work very successfully with a 50 to one dev to test ratio. That tester is one of the most important people in the company, um, and they're doing a completely different, extremely high value role. Um, they're finding all the holes in devs thinking and unknown unknowns. Um, but earlier on, it should be one to one dev to test ratio because there's a different job that test is, is doing. So really depends on your context. Just a tiny point. One, one of the things that I think we've gotten in a trap of uh, with XP is the word test is overloaded. Yes. So what is a test? Is it 
a unit test can be something to preserve developer intention. It could be something to test the boundary condition on a small way. Um, and so because it's so overloaded, everybody thinks they can test. And in some ways, everyone can, and that's great. That's how you bring full quality ownership to a team, but also the discipline of uh, testing is really important. And so the ratio is, again, highly context dependent. You want to make sure you have enough testing expertise in what you're doing so that the test you're writing, the automation you're doing is, is solid. Uh, and I, I can't tell you what that is without knowing your, your, your actual individual setup, but I would caution you to really think about testing as a discipline. And the, the best functional or you know testers in the world and people who really think about this are amazing. I don't know if you've ever seen a talk by Michael Bolton. Uh, he, I mean, he blows my mind. I'm like, wow, you thought to do that thing? Why did you think to test that? Um, and so if you don't have that um, in your team, you need to get it. All right, thank you. Thank you guys for entertaining us. <laughs> All right, dinner is served outside. It's, uh, you don't need any coupons or anything. You can just go have dinner and hang around. We'll be around here for at least another few hours. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>